Uh, next, we have our second bill up, which is House File 1850. Representative Bierman, would you care to move your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I'd like to move uh, House File 1850, and I do have an amendment as well. Representative Bierman moves that House File 1850 be laid over, and you have the A2 amendment. Uh, would you like to speak to your amendment, Representative Bierman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This this amendment is uh, thanks to the sharp eye of uh, Mr. Eliff, and it's an amendment that just clarifies eligibility and capacity for the bill. Uh, any questions to the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A2 say aye. 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 No. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Bierman, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thanks for the opportunity to present and your attention to hearing bill at number 1850. This is a bill for a temporary tax credit for the purchase and installation of solar energy systems. And please take a look at the letter of support from Mencia in your packet, please. Uh, this tax credit will help Minnesotans across the state participate in our clean energy transition. Members, as we've heard in committee, we are behind as a state in our goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The more we do now, the longer the runway becomes to manage other sectors of the economic transformation that will take more time. Solar energy continues to drop in cost and is still a small slice of our current energy portfolio. Expanding our use of solar is a wise approach to procuring our future energy needs here in Minnesota. This bill is designed to increase the opportunity for all Minnesotans to have access to a solar systems rebate in every county of our state. Not everyone can participate in a program like solar rewards offered through Excel Energy or Minnesota Power's Solar Sense. With this bill, every homestead, every farm, Every business is able to apply and receive a tax credit on the investment of a solar energy system. It is a tried and true formula and good public policy. This program has helped spread solar across every county of Iowa. The program has historically sold out early every year, resulting in wait lists. In Iowa, this bill has generated hundreds of millions of dollars in local economic activity. If enacted here, we will create jobs across the state of Minnesota. Of course, saving home and business owners money on electric bills with a clean renewable resource is another primary purpose of this legislation. A typical system pays off in eight to 12 years. The savings start immediately. It is an investment upgrade in one's home and property too, increasing property values. Offering this small tax credit is an added incentive that will encourage many more Minnesotans to make the energy investment in their future. State level policies like this bill are instrumental in paving the way to a more sustainable clean energy future. It is good for the pocketbook of all Minnesotans when we support less fossil fuels. This bill is good for the grid, it's good for the economy, and it's a good for our environment. And the longer we delay in robustly addressing climate change from all angles, the more destructive and costly are the ramifications. Mr. Chair, I would like the committee to hear from a few testifiers as well, please. Absolutely. First, we have uh, Griffin Dooling. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Chair Long. Thank you, Representative Bierman, members of the committee. Uh, I'm very excited about this, uh, this bill. You know, we've seen firsthand in working with commercial and industrial customers across the upper Midwest, a lot of which are in agribusinesses and rural businesses, the impact that this uh, program, a very similar program to what's proposed here, has had in Iowa on uh, customers looking to install solar for their small business or their home. And I think it's really important to emphasize that this program, as Representative Bierman has designed it, is tailored to focus on small and mid-sized businesses and homes. This is not designed for super large scale solar. It's not designed for solar gardens. It's not designed for utility scale solar. It's designed to help individual businesses and homeowners install systems that can help them over the long term save a very significant amount of money. The average agricultural business that we work with 
can save over $200,000 uh, over the life of a system from installing a solar array. That's very significant money in these communities in, in rural Minnesota and in agribusinesses where, uh, you know, otherwise uh, you often have challenges and, and, and issues to overcome with the way that the uh, agribusiness economy has gone. And so this program will help make those projects more feasible for more farms, more homesteads in these communities that don't have access to the, some of the investor-owned utilities and other incentives that are available uh, in those areas and in, in the metro areas. Uh, so we're you know, very supportive of this proposal. We've seen firsthand the impact that it's made in our neighboring state of Iowa with nearly $300 million of private investment stimulated by this sort of program. And uh, I think it can have a very similar and probably an even greater effect uh, here in Minnesota, which will allow businesses uh, like mine to create a lot of jobs and will help uh, citizens in these rural communities access solar in a way that's more competitive and more fair when compared to their metro counterparts. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Micah Johnson. Welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, Chair and, and committee. Uh, Micah Johnson, I'm from Solar Connection in Rochester, Minnesota. I've been doing solar for more than 10 years. Our company employs 25 people, all from greater Minnesota. They live in Rochester, Spring Valley, Hayfield, Byron, Plainview, et cetera. Uh, and I prefer to, to do jobs and systems in, in our home state of Minnesota, but I'm increasingly drawn by the demand to work in Iowa where there's a state tax credit. Um, I approach solar very much from an economic and market perspective. We have no fossil fuels here in Minnesota. What we do have is plenty of sunlight. Sure, we're not Arizona, but we're actually on par with Houston and Miami for our levels of sunlight. Uh, I think it's well known that Minnesota sends $20 billion a year out of state for energy because we have no fossil fuels here. Imagine if we could just keep 5% of that in the state, just 5%. What, what could you do with a billion dollars of economic activity? Imagine another billion dollars floating around the economy and remember the dollars in the local economy circulate seven times or whatever the research says. With that kind of boost, you'd be able to cut taxes and still pay for all the other stuff. This bill is designed for small scale solar, which, which by definition is more local and has much more local economic benefit compared to the large scale solar. When you drive by the utility scale solar construction sites, you, you see a lot of out of state license plates, largely because of our restrictive labor requirements pushed by the electrical union. But small scale solar is installed by local folks. All of my 25 employees live in Minnesota. As I mentioned, we have no fossil fuels here and hence very, very few fossil fuel jobs. But nationally, there are more solar jobs than jobs in coal or natural gas. And that trend will hold true in Minnesota as, as well. The thing to remember is energy transitions are nothing new. Uh, and again, I'm talking about the tax credit, not the transition stuff, but, but this is part of a transition. And just like our transition to the cell phone or the computer, it, this transition is going to happen whether we want it to or not. Those who are leaders in such transitions benefit from them, and those who are followers have to play catch up. And I'd, I'd like Minnesota to be a leader. A vote against solar is, is a vote to send money out of the state for energy. It's a vote against the Minnesota economy. It's a vote against Minnesota businesses. It's a vote against energy independence, and it's a vote against local jobs. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Micah Cornea. Welcome to the committee. Good morning, committee members, and thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> My name is Micah Cornier, and I'm here representing All Energy Solar in support of House File 1850. All Energy Solar is a customer-focused local solar energy installer based in St. Paul. I am the inside sales manager for our company. We are the first line of communication when inquiring minds have questions about if rooftop solar is right for them. In my short three-year tenure with the company, I have shepherded over 300 people into solar projects and have made more than 36,000 solar-related phone calls. I would consider myself an expert at connecting with Minnesotans about their fears, as well as aspirations around energy security. House File 1850 would further expand solar rooftop access to residents and businesses in Minnesota who get their energy from co-ops and municipal power providers by way of a state tax credit. <clears throat> Let me tell you why. From the Northwest Angle and the Arrowhead region down to the Twin Cities and Iowa border, people want solar. Unfortunately for many Minnesotans outside of utility areas that offer rebates, the barrier to entry is greater. In parts of Minnesota, a common theme I hear from folks is that they are interested in solar but there aren't incentives like there are in other places. 
I can't tell you how often uh, I hear a co-op member ask me, does the state have any incentives yet? Our farmers and manufacturing communities are looking for ways to drive down operating costs. Energy storage is of particular concern for homeowners who tell me that when there is a power outage, they won't get power back for a couple of days. House file 1850 would be the kickstart many of our Minnesota friends need in order to take control of their energy independence and security. Furthermore, solar energy creates high paying local jobs. Careers in renewable energy are amongst the fastest growing in the nation, and that's true here in Minnesota as well. We would love to open up an office outside the metro to more quickly serve solar demand there. This bill would drive that demand and create well-paying renewable energy jobs in communities outside the Twin Cities. By helping homeowners and businesses save money on utility costs, as well as creating local jobs in the communities they serve, this bill means more reinvestment of disposable income into local communities. The solar energy economy is not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. It is a Minnesota issue, and all energy solar will stand in support of any legislation that benefits all Minnesotans. For these reasons, we are in support of House File 1850. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's no public testifiers signed up, so we will move to member questions, and we'll begin with Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, this is a question for the testifiers. Do the uh, people who install solar, do they pay anything towards the maintenance of the grid, uh, of the electrical grid um, with that, with this tax credit or in general in any other way? Looks like Mr. Dooling would like to take that. Representative Grinhagen, thank you for the question. I think this is a very important question to raise. Uh, there's a few pieces here that are, are important to note. The first piece is that if you install a cogeneration system of any kind, whether that's wind or solar or any other technologies that are available, uh, you do still have a fixed fee that you pay, uh, typically called a meter charge, uh, and that can range from $20 to even more depending on the size of the site. And so that goes towards uh, the utility's uh, fixed costs of service. Utilities in the state of Minnesota, particularly the municipal and cooperative utilities, also have the option to levy an additional monthly fee uh, called the distributed generation grid access fee to recover uh, additional costs if they uh, feel like that's necessary to make their, uh, their service territory viable. And the other piece here that's very, very important to note that I think is often uh, uh, missed in this conversation is that uh, all of the utility companies in the state, the cooperatives and municipals that work with an overall uh, generation and transmission utility, a GNT like Great River Energy, are able to get reimbursed for the net costs of serving their member owners that have uh, solar projects or wind projects uh, from that GNT. So when you look at the overall cost impact of these uh, investment decisions that individual homeowners or, or farms or businesses are making, uh, that impact to the grid is ultimately spread across the millions of members that are served by uh, the GNT, very similar to, to Excel Energy. And so ultimately, uh, the impact on any one individual bill uh, is essentially negligible. It looks like Mr. Johnson wanted to chime in as well. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. I, I've interconnected with, I, I last count, somewhere around 18 different utilities, and uh, there's always a wide variety of, of, of ways that that's done, of course, but all of them have, a, a, of course, an application fee. Most of them have an interconnection fee. Some of those up are up around $1,000. Uh, and then there's always the, uh, the aforementioned distributed access generation fee uh, that is also uh, levied by many utilities. And then anytime there is a grid upgrade, every, every single utility looks at their local distribution system and, and decides, is there a, a necessary upgrade to, to be done to have this? And anytime there is a grid upgrade, yes, it's the, the customer or the installation company, one or the other, or a combination thereof that pays for that for that grid upgrade. Thank you. Representative. Uh, Mr. Chair, get a, oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response. My concern is that, uh, uh, you know, I don't have solar on my house. I live out in the country and all I've seen is my, my electric bill grow from about 6.99 cents per kilowatt hour up to almost 12 cents a kilowatt hour. And I've tried to take every step I can to, to correct that. And uh, so it just seems, I guess the question would be, is there an independent analysis of this bill that actually shows 
it would have negligible or no effect on other ratepayers who don't have solar because solar itself has been bailed out by other ratepayers with higher costs to maintain the grid. And that's not right because a lot of those solar uh, people who don't have solar are low income piece, people who can barely afford their electric bill already. So is there an independent analysis done that actually shows, and you know, not that I don't, don't trust your testimony, but each one of you make money off of this. And making money off something tends to warp a person's perspective at times. Not saying it's true, but that, that's been my experience. <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to see an independent analysis that this doesn't drive up the rates of people who don't have solar. Is there such an analysis on this bill? Thank you. Uh, Representative Bierman, did you have anything? I, I see your test writers would like to speak to it as well. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as far as individuals go, again, certainly the, the individuals who get solar, and, and I would advise uh, Representative Grunhagen, you know, if he's concerned about his electric bill, number one, you should get a quote from one of these individuals on what solar could do for you at your house to lower your electric costs. That'd be first and foremost. And I guess I'd let my testifier speak more to his overall point about those who don't have it and what that impact will be. They're specialists and know about this. Uh, absolutely. If we could be brief, because we just have a couple more minutes on this bill. Representative, or Mr. Dooling. Sure. Thank you, Chair Long. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, that's a very good question. Uh, there's no study that I'm aware of on this particular specific bill that we're discussing today. Uh, but recently, there was a study that was published by the University of Michigan, which evaluated uh, distributed solar in a variety of different contexts across the country. And that study found that having uh, a higher penetration of distributed solar within a utility service footprint can actually lead to a lower cost of service for that utility in many respects, because these uh, systems that are getting installed reduce the peak demand that needs to be served by the distribution system. It reduces the individual customer's demand and overall uh, offsets the need for expensive transmission upgrades and other distribution capacity upgrades within the area uh, that's being served. Uh, and as uh, Micah noted, this is also a situation where if an upgrade to the grid is necessary to service that customer who's installing solar, that is the customer's responsibility. And so that, uh, that specific expense is not spread across uh, the neighbors or the other member owners uh, in, that, uh, in that area. You could, if you could share that study with us, we'll uh, distribute it to the committee members. Uh, Mr. Johnson, and then we'll have to move on. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative, for the question. It's a, it's a good one. I've done a lot of study on this. Uh, in addition to the Michigan Tech study or Mich University of Michigan study that he's referencing, there's a variety of other studies out there. I'm happy to share them. Uh, and, and then there are some studies that show that the distributed solar does raise rates for other folks. So there are studies that have gone both ways. The thing that I've found with those studies, and I, and I appreciate your point about follow the money, right, is the ones that show that distributed solar raises rates for other folks are generally funded by fossil fuel companies or utilities. The ones that show that distributed solar rate, uh, does not raise rates for others or sometimes even lowers rates for others are usually done by independent parties. They're not done by solar companies. They're not done by solar people. They're generally done by universities or, or think tanks or people that, that, that aren't making money off the solar. So I, I think that's an important distinction to make. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Representative, uh, any closing comments to your bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just uh, appreciate the committee's time. I uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Eliff's help in that amendment, and I appreciate the testifiers being here present today with all the great information and the good questions from uh, Representative Grunhagen. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Johnson's last point is important for all of us, not only in this committee, but in every committee. Uh, source of information matters and confirmational biases are tough for all of us to overcome sometimes. So look at the data, look at the source and talk to people. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thanks again to the testifiers. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Representative Bierman renews his motion and House File 1850 as amended is laid over.